Go oh, Ils sont bien, ils sont bien. Hein. Oh, ils sont super. Euh, merci de venir ici. Je suis, je suis ravi de vous présenter Matt. Vous ne l'applaudissez pas Moi, j'ai le droit à bonjour. Ah Euh, Matt travaille dans une société qui s'appelle Benchmark. Alors moi, ce que j'adore chez Benchmark, c'est I, I say everything in French, so I can say good thing without any kind of issue. Non, euh, ce que j'aime bien chez Benchmark, c'est que dès que vous voyez un succès dans le monde sur une société, il y a un, un venture capital qui est derrière, c'est Benchmark. Donc c'est assez facile. Donc vous prenez tous les grands succès, vous avez Benchmark, donc il y a eu Twitter avant. Aujourd'hui, dans les trucs à la mode, il y a Uber, il y a Snapchat, il y a Tinder, je crois, j'ai vu ça dans la presse. Le, tous ces trucs-là qui marchent, que vous utilisez, c'est toujours Benchmark. Et Benchmark est une société très différente, et, il va, et, et Matt va vous l'expliquer mieux que moi, c'est qu'ils sont que 20. Donc c'est une toute petite société qui lève pas de fonds, qui trouve les meilleures sociétés, qui prend 25% de leur capital et qui les aide à devenir des très grandes sociétés et qui ne se plante pas souvent. Voilà. Donc je suis ravi que Matt soit, soit là à Paris. Il aime bien Paris, donc il y a quelques jours et tant mieux. Il a eu la gentillesse de venir vous parler en anglais. Je vous plains parce que vous êtes comme moi, vous parlez aussi bien anglais que moi. <rire> Mais je suis sûr que vous aurez plein de questions à lui poser ensuite. Voilà. Merci et je te laisse parler, Matt. Salut So sorry, uh, I can understand French a little bit and I can speak a really, really little bit, but I can't really speak French. So I'm sorry if, if we speak English, hopefully it's okay for everybody here. Um, but if you want to ask a question in French, we can, I can understand some and these guys will help. So I, I didn't prepare a speech. Um, I don't want to give a long, boring talk. I think it's much more interesting if we just all have a conversation together and I'm happy to talk about anything that's on your minds. Um, I'll say two things at the beginning. One, just in case you're curious, you know, why am I here in France right now? Is Benchmark coming to France? Xavier asked me this too, because as he said, we're very small. There's only five of us. And uh, one of my partners and I are both here right now. So it's like, what's going on? Is Benchmark coming to France? I wish we were coming to France, but we're not coming to France. Um, I am here for the reason that every stupid American comes to Paris, which is pour l'amour. You know, um, <laughs> my girlfriend lives here. Um, she's actually moving to California, um, but she's living here right now. And so I've been coming here and having a life of constant jet lag um, for a little while, just just for my personal life. And unfortunately, I'm going back to California this weekend and she's going back to California soon too. But I love it here, really love it here and hopefully I'll, I'll come back. So just in case you were curious. Um, the, the thing, you know, I th really the only thing I want to say to everyone here up front, and I, I really mean this, you know, 42 is such an incredible, incredible thing. It's such an It's a place, but to me, it's more than a place. It's sort of an idea about what's possible and, and you know, how you can enable people to grow and to learn together um, in a way that can really shape the future. And I think, you know, the people sitting in this room, you are the pioneers of shaping the future. And that's, I mean, it's easy to say that. And, you know, I'm sure it crosses your mind once in a while. But um, don't take that for granted because, you know, everyone, we all get into our day-to-day -day life and you lose perspective on things. And I just want everyone here to know that it's, I look at this, I think it's unbelievable what's going on here. Everyone here should be really proud and really excited and um, really optimistic about the future of what everyone here will create together. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to say, and then we can just talk about whatever you want, happy to talk about my own experience or, or whatever's on your minds, is, and I, I really mean this, um, if I can be successful, and I've been very lucky and have been successful, if I can be successful, every person in this room can be more successful than me. And the reason why I say that is, I think the people in this room are smarter than I am. The people in this room are probably much more capable than I am. I'm not really very good at anything. I'm not a particularly good programmer. I'm not particularly skilled in any kind of management or, or executive areas. I didn't study business. I didn't go to business school. Um, I studied music, actually, as a student. Um, and can program a little bit. Today, I can't program at all. But when I was a kid, I could program a little bit. But I'm not a great programmer. I'm not really great at anything. Um, but, you know, I was very lucky to be in the right places at the right time. And I think most importantly of all, 
I did take some risks and I took some risks at a point in my life when just like everybody in this room, I could afford to take those risks. And I made some very conscious decisions around not doing things early on in my life, which would kind of tie me down in a way that wouldn't allow me to take risks. So I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. We were, we were just, the three of us were just talking about this at lunch. Um, it may sound a little strange or cold, and maybe it was a little bit strange, but I decided very consciously. So first of all, I, I grew up in New York City um, and was very lucky to grow up in that kind of very vibrant and diverse and crazy environment. Um, and I knew that I wanted to move out someday to California because I've always been kind of a geek about the internet since the 80s, like Xavier. Um, and um, it was kind of the place to be then. And I think today you can be in a lot of different places and we can talk about that. But certainly, you know, that, that was what was always in my mind. And I had this very conscious idea that if I wanted to enable myself to take risky bets and to say no to a high salary and a prestigious job and so on, I really needed to not tie myself down. So I very consciously made sure that I didn't own a home, I didn't have any debt, I didn't have um, any real obligations to anyone. It sounds kind of selfish, but it probably it was, but I didn't have any real obligations. I didn't get married at a young age because I was afraid, well, if I have children, then I'm gonna have to support my children when I'm in my 20s and then I'll have to have a high salary. And so I was able, I was in this very flexible position where because I didn't have um, really any bills to pay, any debts to pay off, any, uh, any you know, children to take care of. I was lucky that I didn't have to take care of my, my older relatives at that time. Um, I could just sort of do what I wanted. And I was able to take the opportunities where the salary was really bad and really low, but the potential future opportunity was really good. And I was extremely lucky in how that all worked out and we can talk more about it. But, um, but that's the main thing that I would want everybody in the room to come away from today. If we stop this discussion right now, the thing that I would hope that everybody would think is, if I can do this, you can all do this. I'm sure of that. I, I, I'm positive I would not get into 42 if, if I tried to get into 42. There's no way I would get into 42. And I still managed to succeed in spite of that. So just imagine the people who actually can get into 42, I, I mean, the sky is the limit. You can do anything. I really mean that. Um, and one of the things that's greatest about 42 is, Unlike the other elite places to learn in France and in the United States, for that matter, this is free. You know, of course, there's, f there's free schools in France, but they're not all that great. Um, and this is a really, really as great as it gets environment to learn in, and it's free. And so everyone will leave here without having all of these bills to pay and all of these things that are tying them down. And... Don't take that for granted either, because that gives you the ability to do whatever you want, because you don't have these debts to pay off. And some people in this room, I don't know everybody's personal life situation. Maybe some people have relatives to take care of or children to take care of, or, and that, of course, you have to do that. But as much as possible, whenever you leave here, please don't take it for granted that you're relatively unencumbered and at the point in time in your life where you can afford to take whatever risks you want to take. And then, of course, the question is, okay, well, what risks should I take and what risks should I not take and how to think about that? And we can talk a little bit about that today if people are curious about that. But that's all I wanted to say up front. And from there, happy to go wherever you guys or anybody here wants to go and anything people want to talk about. So it's always hard to ask the first question, but this group of people, I think somebody will do it. So, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to sit down just because I don't, you know, to me, it's easier to have a conversation when everybody's sitting down than when I'm standing up here and everybody's sitting down. So the question was, what did I do in my mid-20s when I finished my studies? So I'll answer that question, um, and I'll take us a little bit back to give you kind of the context and the broader story on it. Um, so the punchline of the answer to the question is the thing that I did between the time that I was 18 and 20. Five, that was most important for me was to fail and screw up a lot of things over and over and over again. And do it, I mean, I'm serious. And, and doing that was really important because I think the only way you can actually figure out 
what you're good at and what you care about and what you're passionate about is by screwing things up. And, you know, the, everyone in this room is extremely lucky in that we all have an abundance of opportunities available to us in the world. And so it's, I think, to think about, oh, what should I do is actually not the right question because there's lots of possible good answers to that question. I think the more important question, especially when you're between the age of 18 and 25, is to answer even 18 to 30, is to answer the question, what should I not do? Um, and, you know, if you, if you, I mean, you're all developers, you understand the importance of constraints. And, you know, once you actually have some constraints on this problem and you've kind of bounded your search face a little bit, um, you'll get to a good answer. So a lot of what I did between the time that I was 18 and 25 was about screwing different things up and along the way realizing, okay, you know what? I probably shouldn't do that. I probably shouldn't do that. So um, I'll tell you more specifically what, what I did. So I was always, when I was a little kid, I was always very passionate about music and technology in general, but the internet in particular, I would say. And this was in the 80s before there were web browsers and you know when Xavier was geeking out on his old BBS systems and maybe some people were here too and I was and we were talking about this last night. Um, but even then, you know, the internet was this, um, in, in the Minitel in France, you know, these, these things were like these, these new ways for people to share and communicate with each other. And the implications of what that could do for society and for culture and for ec the economy and for the world and, you know, for people was just always really fascinating to me. And so for whatever reason, I was always really interested in that. And separately, I was always really in interested in music. I know a lot of kind of nerdy people like computers and music, and I'm definitely one of those people. Um, but I never really liked computer music. I liked analog music, and I liked technology. Um, and so when I was 18, um, I actually thought that I was, I was hoping I was going to be a musician, actually, when I was 18. Um, and when I finished the high school in the US, um, prior to the university when I was 18. I didn't immediately go to university. I went to try to be successful as a working musician, actually. Um, and um, that was, <coughs> I was a very hard life. Um, I wasn't good enough to do it. Um, I came from a stable family, not a, not a very rich family, not a very poor family, but just like, you know, a, middle class family where if my parents saved their money for years and years, they could send me to a good university, um, which they did. Um, but it, it wasn't it wasn't easy for them, but it was possible. Um, and so before I went to university, I just said, well, I don't care that much about money and I just want to do what I want to do. And I want to see if I can be a musician. So I tried to be a musician and I wasn't quite good enough to make it as a musician. And I was like, you know what, if I do this, I know that I'm going to end up teaching, you know, little kids how to play music for the rest of my life. That's my destiny if, if I'm doing this. And that's important and somebody needs to do that. And I have a lot of respect for the people who do that, but I don't want to do that. So um, I decided I'm not going to do that. So that was kind of the first thing that I failed at. Um, and it was actually, it was like heartbreaking for me at the time. It really was because I really wanted to do this. And it was a really hard thing to decide, you know what? it doesn't make sense. Like given my level of ability and given the way that this market works and you know what, what the needs are for this in the world, I'm not gonna do this. So then after that, I went to uh, university for a while and I studied music and computer science at university. And Xavier and I were talking about this yesterday. The university that I went to in the US, um, which is Yale University, is a, is a very, very, academically oriented old school university. They do not teach programming at all. They teach computer science. And computer science is really a form of discrete mathematics, essentially. And in the time that I was doing that there, I literally didn't, I mean, I barely ever turned on a computer. And all the people who were there, their aspiration was to solve the big open unsolved problems in theoretical computer science, P equals NP, the stuff means something to some of you people probably. Um, and it's like, yes, if I can figure that out, like that's, you know, answer that open question, like that's the holy grail. Um, and that's what people cared about in that environment. And I didn't care about that. I mean, it's, again, it's important, it's interesting, but I'm not a mathematician. I learned a lot from it, but it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't what I needed to be to be a great programmer. Then I did do some programming. I programmed as a kid too, and I was okay at it, but I wasn't really great at it. Um, 
So I'd never really liked being in a traditional university environment. I thought it was uh, kind of stifling, and I was very appreciative that I had the opportunity to go there, but I, I didn't like it. So after I did that for a couple of years, I left again, and I got the opportunity. This was in 1998. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers 1998, but it was a very frothy time in the technology world and in the stock market, kind of like today, perhaps. Um, and in, in 1998, you know, you could be some 21-year-old idiot like me who spoke a little bit of Chinese and who, you know, knew a little bit about how computers worked. And like five startups in Beijing, China would be desperate to hire you, you know, um, because this was the timing of 1998. So I was really fascinated by what was going on in China in 1998. And so I left university in 1998, and I moved to Beijing, China, and worked there for a startup um, for a year, which was an incredible experience. I didn't start the company. I wasn't doing anything there that was particularly important for the company or that really made a difference for the company. But it was a great experience. And for me, it, I didn't want to stay in China because I felt like I could never be in the center of things in China, but it was a great learning experience. And so it was, a, it was successful in that it got me, it sort of reaffirmed the idea in my mind that I wanted to work in technology if I was not going to work in music. Um, and it also was sort of a failure in the sense that I'd been really excited about China, but after I spent a year there, I was like, God, there's no way I could ever be really in the center of what's going on here in Beijing because I'm not Chinese. And at least in 1998, I felt like if you're not Chinese, you can't be in the center of what's going on in Beijing. So in 1999, I went back to the US and I finished university. Um, and then I graduated in 2001. Um, and I was trying to figure out, okay, now what am I gonna do? Because I'm not a great engineer. I'm not really an entrepreneur. I don't really have any skills. I didn't really like going to university. It was, not, it was kind of like an awful experience for me. Um, and I know I want to work in startups in some way, but like, I don't know how to do anything. So like, what, what am I going to do? Um, so I, I, um, I interned for, I thought, well, maybe I should be like an investor in startups or something. So I interned for a big private equity firm in New York City, um, which is very different from a Silicon Valley style venture capital firm. And we could talk about that later if, if you guys are interested. Um, and it was also a complete disaster. Like, it did a horrible job. It was a complete cultural mismatch. Um, you know, I like wearing T-shirts, and these people are all wearing suits all the time. I was just like, God, I can't handle this. And I didn't like them. They didn't like me. It was, it was not a good experience. So that made me feel like, OK, I'm not going to be working in private equity. So much for that. And I probably shouldn't be working in finance in New York or any of that, because it's the wrong culture. So I'm, I do just, I got to go to California. So I took my dad's old car and I drove across the country and I moved to Silicon Valley. Um, today, all the startups in California are in San Francisco, but back then they were all in Palo Alto and Mountain View and these little suburban towns that are called Silicon Valley. Um, there's still a few startups there, but most of them are in San Francisco now. And um, so I moved out to Silicon Valley and the timing of that was just really, really lucky. Um, I moved out there in 2001 which was the exact time that everybody else was leaving, basically. And um, there was a joke in 2001. Do you all, have you heard the, the expression B2B, like business to business for a company, and B2C is like you know, business to consumer? So there was this joke in 2001 that what B2B really means is back to banking. And what B2C really means is back to consulting. Because all of these people from the East Coast who had MBAs and so on had come out to California to seek their big fortune. And then the whole thing collapsed in 2001. And they all moved back East and went to go work for consulting and banking firms and so on. Um, so that was, that was the motto in 2001 was, yeah, back to banking, back to consulting. Um, but I, I, you know, I was just like oblivious to all of this. It's not that I had some genius contrarian idea. I was just honestly kind of clueless about it and didn't know and didn't care, and I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. So I moved out there. Um, I did actually, ironically enough, the only job I could get in 2001 was consulting. Um, and I did that for 18 months. And although I'm, again, very grateful for having had the opportunity to do it, that was probably the single worst uh, working experience of my life, possibly the single worst experience of my life, period. 
um, which means I've had a very lucky life. Um, but it was really, really unpleasant. I mean, like, you know, it was incredibly corporate and hierarchical and slow moving and political and just not honestly, just not particularly interesting. Um, I did meet some great people there. I learned a lot, but uh, it's not something I would recommend to anybody who can, you know, like turn on a computer, for example. Um, so um, the thing that was really lucky was the timing of that was just as the internet was turning back around again. Um, and so at the end of 2002, in 1999, there were probably tens of thousands of people who had moved, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people, who had moved to the Bay Area because they wanted to work in startups. And by 2002, they were all gone. And there was nobody left. And there were literally, I mean, uh, I knew every single person who cared about internet startups in Silicon Valley in 2002 because you, you literally could have fit all of us into this room, like every, every single person. So of course, everybody knew each other. And Google existed and eBay existed, but those were like the two big companies. And other than that, there were just these small startups. There were even a couple of French people, I think. I think that's when I met, I don't know where Florian went. I think that's when I met Loïc uh, for the first time, was in like Loïc Demure, was in like 2003. He was the French guy, you know. And they were literally like, you could fit everybody into this room. Um, and um, so the timing of that was just really lucky. And I met this, this guy um, who I thought was really amazing, named Reed Hoffman, who's a pretty famous person in the startup world now, but was not a famous person in the startup world then. Um, th this group of people who had worked at PayPal as the founders and early employees, very entrepreneurial group of people at PayPal, um, they all left the company after it was sold to eBay at the end of 2002. And because this was the time when you could fit everybody who cared about internet startups in Silicon Valley into this room, I got to know every single one of these people. We, everybody who cared about the internet, you know, at that time in the Bay Area, we all kind of knew each other. And um, so Reed was the person who I really gravitated to most strongly, and I felt like, you know, I could really learn a lot from this person. Um, and so I was very, very lucky um, to get the opportunity to just go work with him and work for him, essentially. And I didn't really have a job exactly. I was just kind of his, his apprentice or his helper. Um, he was doing some angel investing in startup companies, and he was incubating in his mind two ideas for companies. Um, one of them was this time machine, ca time capsule, not time machine, for the future, um, where you could put your... Um, put your kind of digital assets into some like time capsule and then your future generations could see them and so on. And that didn't really go anywhere. Um, and the other one that I was helping him with was this idea of if you could take like a, a social network for business people and, you know, help them to kind of manage their professional identity and their professional relationships. And that was this thing called LinkedIn. And that did go somewhere, actually. Um, and so at the, uh, in May of 2003, um, we launched LinkedIn. And it took off much faster than we thought it was going to take off. It, um, I think we reached 10,000 users by September of 2003. And we're like, oh my god, we have 10,000 users. You know? And today, if you had an application or a site with 10,000 users after you know, a year of work on it, you'd be like, oh, let's just shut it down. You know? Um, but at that point in time, I was like, oh my god, it's amazing. Um, so, we, so he stopped doing his other activities. I stopped doing other activities too, and I just went to work with him and for him full time at LinkedIn. And I didn't know how long that was going to last because I, I love Reed and I loved working for Reed and I learned so much from him um, and working with him. Um, and he's still one of my, you know, the, I almost can't say closest friends, like one, almost like family, like one of the people I care about the most in the world. Um, and um, I maybe would have been there for many years, but at the end of 2004, beginning of 2005, um, Mark Zuckerberg and Dustin Moskovitz, who were at Harvard, dropped out of Harvard and moved out to Palo Alto because they decided to take this thing that they had created in their dorm room called the Facebook and bring it out to California. Um, and shortly after they did that, um, they hired a guy who I knew in the Bay Area named Sean Parker. And this again was because we were all, we, you could fit all of us in this room together. Um, and Sean had been one of the co-founders of a company called Plaxo. And in 2003, there were basically two consumer internet startups in the Bay Area, two total. 
which were focused on business people. One was LinkedIn, the other was Plaxo. And because of that, we talked like almost every day. Um, and so Sean and I got to know each other pretty well. Reed Hoffman was um, actually somebody who knew Sean from angel investing. And Reed introduced Sean to a guy named Peter Thiel, who had been the CEO at PayPal, the founder and CEO at PayPal. And Sean then introduced Mark Zuckerberg to Peter Thiel to do the angel investment in the Facebook. And so Peter did the angel investment in the Facebook. And a couple months after he did it, Peter and Sean said, we need somebody who will just help do stuff here. We'll do all the stuff that the other four of us don't have time to do. Um, so Peter uh, approached, Peter and Sean approached Reed and said, hey, we need some random person to just help get stuff done. Do you mind if we talk to Matt about that? Um, because he can just do random stuff, and, and that's true. And um, Reed said, yeah, it's fine, like, and that's Reed's philosophy of life, is you should do whatever the right thing is for the person. It didn't hurt that Reed was an angel investor in the Facebook as well, um, but I think he would have done it anyway. And so they came to me and said, hey, we'd like you to come over from LinkedIn to the Facebook. And I spent some time talking to them about it and ultimately decided, yep, I should do that. So I did. Um, and I worked at the Facebook and Facebook um, from the very beginning of 2005 until the end of 2008 for about four years um, from the time we were, so I was at LinkedIn from the time we were about 10 people until the time we were about 100 people. And I was at Facebook from the time we were uh, seven people to the time we were about 1,000 people. Um, and both of those experiences were incredible, but the Facebook experience, just because we grew so quickly, was unbelievably incredible. And at that point in time, um, I was approached by two of the other five partners at Benchmark who I'd known through raising money for LinkedIn and the Facebook when I was an employee there. And they said, hey, you know, will you come over and be a venture capitalist? And um, that seemed like the right thing to do for me personally, because as I said at the beginning, I was never a good programmer. I was never a good manager or a good executive. And I didn't want to try to be great at those things. I didn't really care. I just liked working with entrepreneurs and finding things early on and just kind of helping them to grow things. So for me, it was the right thing. And I said, yeah, OK, let's do that. Um, so that was that's the quick summary of my ridiculously lucky last 10 years. And to come back to where I started with that on, you know, what of that is applicable to everybody in this room? I think there's a couple of things that are applicable to everybody in this room. The first is, and these are, let me say two separate things about this. So first, some of the people here, hopefully a lot of the people here are going to start companies or try to start companies. I think, you know, if you can build something or make something yourself and everybody in this room is learning how to build and make something themselves, why not do it? I mean, really, especially when you're at a point in time where you can afford to take that risk. If you actually have a passion for something and there's something that you really want to see exist in the world, go do that. If not, then another thing that you can consider doing is to go work with another small group of people who are already on the path towards making something. And the thing to keep in mind about that is, just remember, not every job is either entrepreneur that starts something or, you know, random employee at a 25,000 person company. You can actually be something in between, which is one of the very first people to kind of take something from something that's small to something that gets to hopefully be bigger. And that's the thing that I chose to do in part because I don't have the skills to build something myself. Um, but you know, for some people it's a better fit for their personality and their passions and what they love to do and are good at. Um, to join something small versus starting something. So if you do decide to join something small, the lesson that I would take away from my own experiences, which were very lucky on this front, were um, the two things that are really good bets to make are if you have the opportunity to work with someone closely, work with someone and learn from someone um, and develop kind of a depth of a set of relationships in the area that matters to you, with someone who you think is really incredible, that's always a good bet, regardless of what exactly it is that the person is doing. But the key to that is like, it has to be somebody really, really incredible. Like somebody who you look at and say, this is what Reed Hoffman was for me. Somebody that you look at and say, 
I've never met anybody like that in my life. I've never met someone that I could learn from as much as this person. I've never met someone who's going to help me grow as much as this person and, you know, who I enjoy spending 16 hours a day talking to, like, day after day after day. If you find one of those situations and you don't want to start a company yourself, that's a pretty good way to go. Um, from the Facebook experience, it turned out that Mark Zuckerberg is as good of a CEO as any person on the planet. I'm absolutely convinced of that today. Um, I did not know that that was going to be the case when I first met him and started to work for him when he was 19 years old. I didn't know that. Um, I wish I could say, yeah, I knew that. I absolutely didn't know that. What I did believe about Mark I, and the Facebook were two things. One, that he wasn't a nut job who was going to completely fuck this thing up. And like that, that was that was really important because there's lots of stories of great opportunities that actually get screwed up by crazy people. And I knew that Mark wasn't one of those people. The main reason why I knew that Mark was not one of those people was because he never, he almost never talked except when he was asking questions. And I was like, huh, this guy is just somebody who listens all the time and you know tries to learn as much as he can all the time. Um, so his career is very smart, but also somebody who was just really interested in growing and learning as much as possible. And then the other thing that was going on at the Facebook was it had this incredible, really incredible, completely organic growth and momentum happening um, in a way that is the sort of thing that we look for in investment opportunities at Benchmark. And if we have time, we can talk about what I mean by that. So you know, just to sum that up again quickly, I think if you're going to join something rather than start something, Going to work for someone who you think is a kind of once in 10 years person for you to learn from and, and work with and grow with is a great thing to do. Um, separately, um, going to work on something that has incredible existing early traction with, it, with lots of potential upside and people who you believe at minimum are not going to completely mess it up, that's also a good thing to do. Um, that was the first takeaway that I would take from my own experiences. The second one, just very briefly, and this comes back to where we started on, you know, what did I do between 18 and 25? I kind of screwed up a bunch of stuff as much as possible, is I think when you go through your own journeys of figuring this stuff out, I think there's kind of three questions that you want to keep in mind in the back of your head. And um, if you're going to start a company, some of this isn't relevant. Some of it is, if you're going to join a company or a project, it is all, it's certainly all relevant. Um, and I think the three questions that you want to keep in the back of your mind as you go through this journey are, number one, none of these, these are all obvious, by the way, just, just to warn you. Number one, um, what do I really, really care about in life? What am I really passionate about in life? Number two, what does the world actually care about and value? And number three, and this is the only one which is a little bit subtle, what are the things where I have a relative comparative advantage to other people? So I don't, I don't know if people are familiar with that concept, but um, the idea of comparative advantage is basically saying, I'm not just good at something or great at something, but I'm actually better at it than the other people who are good at it which is actually a really important thing to think about that people sometimes ignore, especially smart people sometimes ignore. Um, so, so to illustrate that concretely, for me, being a musician was not, was gonna fail that test for sure. Because first of all, I'm not even that great at it. Second of all, the world doesn't value it that much. And third of all, uh, you know, I certainly don't have a comparative advantage at it because I'm not even, you know, that great at it. Um, so, like, it passed the test of my personal passion, but it failed on the other two dimensions. Um, I think, to use another musical example, um, you know, I have a lot of friends who are still trying to make it as musicians, and I have some friends who, for example, are, like, really amazing classical pianists. And the thing that they haven't necessarily figured out is, well, you can be a really amazing classical pianist, but given how limited the demand for that is in the world. You don't just have to be great, you have to be like one of the 10 best young classical pianists on the planet Earth. Otherwise, you're still gonna end up teaching little kids how to play music for a living someday. Um, and I think like getting in touch with that reality when you're young is very healthy if you can do it. You know, you really need to believe um, that you have a relative advantage in something if, if you're going to value your own skills. Um, 
And so those three questions, I think anything which kind of falls inside the intersection, if you think of those as three circles, anything which is in the intersection of those three circles is, is a good thing to do. Anything where you say, I have a passion around this, um, you know, the world places some or a lot of value on it, and relative to the other people who are doing it, I think I have a comparative advantage. Anything that, that fits the intersection of all those three things is a great thing to do. Um, for me, doing kind of venture capital and these early stage things, that turned out to be a good thing to do because you know, I'm not great at programming, I'm not great at management, I'm not great at any of those things, and I'm not a founder really, but there weren't that many people who were willing to go work for a small startup in 2003 and say, yeah, sure, whatever, I'll, like, I'll take out the garbage or go re recruit this engineer or what, like, whatever we have to do. Um, there weren't that many people who were excited about doing that, and I was more capable than most of the people who were excited about doing that. Um, and so that, that was what put me in that position. But the only way I could figure out the answer to those three questions was by screwing up a lot of other things along the way and figuring out what I wasn't great at. Um, so it's a long answer to a simple question, but that, that's, that's what I would take away from it. Uh, I have another question, but... Uh <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. That's me. I, oh yeah, I hit okay, the speaker. Okay, I will use yeah. the microphone. Uh, as I said before, I don't like microphones. But I understand. Um, okay. So the... Sorry? Oh, okay, okay. Oh, that's why. Okay. So um, the question is, right now, 42, uh, this was the boom of, in your case, it was boom of social networks online. And we're kind of, there's not just like we cannot fit all these people startups in silicon valley or anywhere yep. now so where what what should we like 42 students kind of what do you see that we could aim for in this sort of it like the internet made like this huge boom what is the next boom where can we aim for uh, sure yeah so first of all i think the greatest entrepreneurs and creators do things and make things because it's something that they want to exist in the world not because some you know idiot venture capitalist says that the internet of things I, I don't know what the internet of things means by the way but you know like the internet of things is going to be huge or the sharing economy is going to be like what are you talking about like you know if, if there's something that you want to make just make it um, now that being said I think it's very healthy to ask yourself questions and to check, like, wait a minute, like, is it actually a good idea for me to make this thing or is it not a good idea for me to make this thing? And the, the way that I would ask that question, the way that I think about, you know, that question when I look at companies to invest in is principally from the perspective of competition and from the perspective of saying, okay, who else is currently trying to do what I'm doing in the world? And how am I going to do better than what they're doing? Um, or who else might try to do, you know, even if it doesn't exist today, what's stopping somebody from going and starting something just like this tomorrow? And, you know, what is it about what I'm building that's going to be better than what they're building? And I think the answers to that that end up really, you know, being true over time have a lot to do with building a product model or a business model or both which have kind of built-in unfair competitive advantages of one kind or another, if you will. Um, so one example of that is a very frequent example of that. You talked about social networks are different forms of what people, especially in Silicon Valley, call network effects. And I'm sure everybody in the room has heard the term network effects and has some general sense of what it means. The basic idea of a network effect is the idea that when you have a graph or a network, um, if there's a network effect present, the utility of that graph or network is going to grow um, somewhat exponentially as the number of uh, nodes in the graph grows linearly. And you know, if you think about that in simple math terms, if you have a, if you have a bunch of nodes and and they're all connected to each other, 
you're going to have basically exponential growth in the number of links as you have linear increase in the number of nodes. So anything where those links, where the values in the links rather than the nodes, if that makes sense, is a network effect. So that, that's the very academic you know, math way of thinking about what a network effect is. To be practical about it, some real world examples of what are network effects. So anything which falls into the category of open source software, for example, is a network effect thing because lots of different people in a decentralized way are contributing to the growth of, of, a, of a technology phenomenon. And so there's a network of people who are contributing. Maybe somebody else will come out with a new technology. Maybe the new technology will be better, quote unquote. But because there's so many people who have already decided that they want to you know, put their, their minds and their effort behind this other one, it's going to keep getting better and better over time. So that's one example of a network effect. A social network product, of course, is another example of a network effect where you could make a product that's better than Facebook or that's better than LinkedIn or that's better than Tinder or that's better than Snapchat or that's better than Twitter. Um, but because so many people have already decided that they want to use this network, they want to be part of this network, it's not hard to build another social network. It's just that, like, you know, who would use it? And you know, may maybe there's an answer to that question, but if you're gonna build another social network, you better have a really good answer to that question in your own mind. Um, if you're gonna build something which competes with an existing open source software um, product, you better have a really good answer in your mind to why more developers are going to wanna use this other thing than the thing that's already got large scale. Um, anything which has a marketplace effect like Uber is a really good example of something that has a network effect. The network effect in Uber is really all about the pickup time that is required to get a ride. Because, and Xavier and I, you know, were joking about this yesterday, like, I can't believe it's taking five minutes, this is horrible. And the reason why that matters is the faster the pickup time is, when you think about it, the more money the drivers make, because faster pickup times means more rides per hour or per day, which means more money for the driver. It also means happier customers because the faster the pickups happen, the happier the customers are with the service. So there's a virtuous cycle where as it gets bigger and bigger, the pickup times get shorter and shorter and shorter, which means there's more and more money for the drivers, more and more demand from the riders, and less and less slack in the system, kind of just open space in the system. Um, so that's another type of network effect. So that, you know, I think network effect is a really good way of, of looking at something and saying, okay, I think I have a sustainable, unfair competitive advantage here. Um, another way that you can build an, an unfair competitive advantage, and I think two entrepreneurs who have really figured this out are the man to my right over here um, and a guy in Seattle named Jeff Bezos, who you've probably heard of. Um, I think, um, we never talked about this, but I think in different ways, these two guys both had this idea of I'm going to take something that's really big that a lot of people care about in the world. I'm going to cut out all the crap and just, you know, keep the stuff that really matters. And because I've cut out all this expensive crap that nobody cares about anyway, I'm going to be able to offer it way cheaper than anybody else can. And good luck to somebody who wants to try to offer it even more cheaply than this because, man, I have dropped the price on this, you know, really close down to the floor. And I think that's been the strategy of those two entrepreneurs and the businesses that they've built is to kind of push the pricing down as far as possible so that they don't leave any room for anybody else to come up under them. I think actually the room that we're sitting in is an example of that, by the way, where 42 as a project to me in a lot of ways is saying, let's cut out all the crap in education that doesn't matter that the students hate and that doesn't provide any value anyway and that just costs all this money and you know creates all this complexity and just get it to be like really good and really cheap and you know that makes it really hard for I mean good luck to somebody who wants to build something better than 42 especially in Ferris I don't think it's going to happen I think I think you people are sitting in the best place possible in Ferris um, and so that's another way to answer this question of how do I develop something that has a, like a really a sustainable unfair advantage against other people who might try to do the same thing, against potential current or potential new competitors. And I think that's a very good check to ask yourself. But again, the place to start is what do I want to do? You know, like what do I want, what do I wish existed in the world? What do I want to build? What do I want to create for myself and for other people and for the world? You can't start with some 
you know, whiteboard and say, well, these are market trends and I'm going to pick a company in this market area. By the time you can do that, it's already too late and people have already won and that's over, you know, and it's time for the next thing. Um, so th that's the way that if I were an entrepreneur, that's the way I would think about it. I would start with saying, what do I wish existed in the world? What do I want to build and create for other programmers or for consumers or for businesses or for, for anything? And then, okay, I think that's really interesting, but how am I going to win? How, how am I going to develop a product model or a business model which allows me to beat all of the current and potential future competitors who are trying to do the exact same thing? And you answer both of those two questions well, you're going to be just fine. Uh, you, you spoke about a very peculiar time where, which was the uh, um, dot-com bubble and you, you started to work at this time. Uh, do, do you think right now um, in a time uh, where there is a lot of companies, uh, do you think you could have the same story 10 years later? Could I have the same story? Um, it's a good question. I think it's harder, honestly, just in terms of the odds and the numbers. I think when you're closer to a top than you are to a bottom, I think it's harder. Um, that being said, I don't think it's impossible. And I think, you know, I mean, I'm still doing the job that I'm doing of looking for great new startups. I did it yesterday. I'm doing it today. And so you just keep doing it. I mean, none of us can change that. It is what it is. I do think it's harder. Just as I said before, I don't think as an entrepreneur or a potential entrepreneur, you should think about the macro environment too much. I think that's true with this issue too. You just, just do it. Um, and you know, many of the best companies were started near bottoms and many of the people who were lucky enough to be successful start at a time that's near the bottom. Um, you know, if you look at 2001 in Silicon Valley, um, when I s moved to Silicon Valley in 2001 and started consulting, the person who had just started down the hall from me was a guy named Sundar Pichai, who's the basically the CEO of Google now, the number two guy at Google. He runs most of the company. And the other person who just moved out to, to Silicon Valley to actually then work at Google as well was Sheryl Sandberg, um, who later joined us at Facebook. And so, you know, the t like there's uh, Sundar and Sheryl are both incredibly talented people, um, much better than I am. But regardless, I think for all of us, the timing was important. So yes, it helps if you can go on the bottom, but you just do what you got to do. The flip side of that is Google was born and funded and grew during probably the most bubbly time in the history of the industry up until that point. Now, it then survived the meltdown because of its model, um, but it got started in the very frothiest of environments. So I don't think you should worry at all, really at all, about the macro environment. I think you should just do the things you want to do as we've been talking about. And I think every startup that succeeds, succeeds because it's an exception to the rule every single time. And so in some way, it doesn't matter what the rules are. As long as you're clever about how you can work around them or exploit them, it's fine. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks for uh, being here. Sure, thank you. Um, I was wondering, so you've invested in a lot of very successful companies like Dropbox, uh, Quora, and uh, Zendesk. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, how, how did you find these guys? Like, uh, I guess those companies were very small at the time you invested, so mm -hmm. what were the, the metrics you were looking for? Was it like a huge user base, uh, uh, monetization potential? What, what was um, sure. what appealed you? Sure. So. Let me answer both parts of that. One, how did I find the companies? And then two, why did I, why did we invest in them? Um, and I say we because it's Benchmark does every investment as a, as a partnership. Um, so um, how I found those people was just through relationships, simple. And just through knowing people and you know having people in common, um, friends or colleagues, and just hearing about these things early on. Um, one thing that's very important about 42 is the relationships that you're building with everybody here. And as you go out into the rest of your life, these relationships, I guarantee you, are going to matter a lot for the rest of your life. So don't be an asshole. Um, <laughs> um, but, but I mean, in all seriousness, these relationships are going to matter a lot for the, for the rest of your life, which is great. Um, why did my partners and I invest in all these companies and in Uber and in Twitter and in Snapchat and Tinder and so on? Um, it's, it's largely out of a belief that the people were somewhere between fine and great, 
Um, and that the, as I was talking about before when we were talking about this earlier question, that either the business model or the product model or both were going to enable the company to continue to have a competitive advantage relative to other companies that were in trying to do the same thing. Um, and then if there's a third piece, I would say it's um, the belief that the thing that they were trying to do really mattered and had the potential to grow a lot. I think Uber is a really good example of this. When we were very lucky to, to uh, do the Series A, so the first kind of venture capital investment into Uber, um, and my, my fund owns, um, owns a big chunk of the company, and because we were involved with it very early, and it looks like, knock on wood, it's going to be a really good investment, and it's an amazing company. Um, and the, you know, a lot of people at the time looked at Uber and said, well, how big can this be? I mean, you know, I mean, it's just taxis. Taxis aren't that big. If it's just these black cars in America, like limousine cars, like that's not very big. It's okay, but it's not very big. Maybe you get 20% of the market for that. And, you know, it's a nice little company, but who cares? It doesn't matter. Um, well, it turned out that what Uber did was completely change the, the kind of demand that existed in, in the market, at least in a lot of places in the world, for having somebody drive you from one place to another place. And when you think about that in terms of the private transportation market or the auto market, that's a huge market. Um, huge, one of the biggest markets in the whole world. And because of this virtuous cycle of the shorter and shorter pickup times that I was talking about before, it actually turns out that within a city, there's a good reason why one company should really be the leader as opposed to lots of little companies. There are other companies, anyone can start one, but you know, it makes sense that there's one leader. Um, and then there's scale effects that go across different cities as well. Um, and so some of that was, again, I wish I could say we knew all that, we had some crystal ball and all that, but a lot of it was just a belief that this was a compelling group of people um, and the way they were going about solving this problem looked like it could really lead to a very interesting position in the market and a change in the market. Um, and there's some metrics that I would look for too, but I think that's the, the single most important thing. The only, the one other thing that I would um, say we look at really carefully is how the companies are getting distribution, um, how the companies are getting users, how the companies are getting customers, how the, if it's a technology thing, how the companies are getting developers to use that technology. Um, in general, it's never quite this simple, but in general, if the company is paying to cause that to happen, is buying advertising, that's not good. Um, if the company is figuring out a way to do that, that doesn't require the company to spend a ton of money on advertising, and in a way that's sustainable without spending a lot of money on advertising, that's much more interesting. And you know, without talking too much about macro themes, because I just said you should ignore the macro themes, and I believe it, um, it's definitely the case that one of the things that happens in technology across cycles is the platform, the underlying platforms for the technology, the operating systems, and, and the infrastructure levels change, and the devices change, and when those things happen, the distribution channels and the distribution models change too. So, you know, the web created this entirely new distribution channel for services and information. Mobile app stores created another new distribution, mobile, forget app stores, just mobile, created another new platform and distribution channel. Um, I think in the last five years, there's been a massive shift that's occurred at a macro level in two areas. One is in the technology platforms, the rise of virtualization, which led to things like Amazon Web Services and cloud computing, and today containerization, which of course, as I'm sure everybody in the room knows, was really pioneered by French technologists who are, for better or worse, now in Silicon Valley at Docker. Um, which, which is one of our portfolio companies at Benchmark, um, that's, um, that's a really significant shift in, in how software gets built. Um, and the transition from the web to mobile is a really significant shift in how software gets distributed. And I do think um, it's really important. We always ask the question, you know, how, how is distribution happening? Or is, is this bought? or is it just adopted? And if it's adopted without lots of spending on marketing to get the distribution, that's a really good sign. And I think you should, if you're gonna start something, you should, if possible, strive to create something where there isn't some unsustainable model of buying ads to get 
new customers all the time. In the long run, that doesn't work out very well. You've been up for a long time. Um, I'm going to, before I ask the question, I'm going to do something which somebody's going to be courageous enough to do. Um, I would love it if somebody in this room who is female rather than male would ask the next question after, after you. <laughs> after you. Yeah, that way, that way the women can have some time to think. But I'm going to put everybody on the spot. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you first, please, please. Yeah, yeah. Somebody, somebody do it. Yeah. Hey, Matt. Um, so uh, y you've been sharing a lot with us uh, so far, and uh, we, I guess we have to be very thankful about it. And I'm uh, not sure about that. <laughs> <but> <laughs> and since you, you put it as a conversation, uh, I'd like to share a little bit back. Uh, sure, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, which ultimately wi is going to lead to my question. Uh, so I've been uh, in 42 since the beginning, mm -hmm. and uh, you've been talking about it in the beginning of, your, of the, the, the conference. Mm -hmm. And I got to say, you're like so right about it uh, when you said so many things are happening. And, uh, you know, I, I don't get to know everyone in school, but uh, I know quite a lot of people. And uh, <laughs> when I look at myself and what happened to me uh, so far, like it's really, really crazy and much more important to the people. I didn't know uh, all these people uh, so uh, like a year before. And I care so much about them right now. And I've seen so many crazy things happening to them. Like I got a friend who went to New York uh, with, a, with a startup, crazy things happening, and, and that's so great. And uh, when you've been talking about 42, uh, something I felt a lot, uh, which I found very genuine, um, is uh, I feel like my perception is you are fond of education. Maybe I, I might be wrong, but that's my feeling. And uh, we are very lucky here in France to, to have Xavier too. And we all are very <laughs> thankful to him. I agree. So my question is now, uh, I don't know what's happening in the US, but how likely you guys uh, would be, now you've seen the school, and I hope you, <laughs> you had the time to see it, to start did, something yeah. looking 42 in the US? It's a great question. Um, I think people are already trying to do it in various ways. Um, I don't think there is an example in the U.S. of any entrepreneur who has both the ability and the interest so far to build something as significant as this in the U.S. And so um, I would love for that to happen, and I'm fine if it happens from you know, some entrepreneur or former entrepreneur or, or somebody else in the United States doing it. And if Sabia wants to do it too, that would be great too. Um, because you know it's one world. And I, th I think that would be awesome. Um, but I think it's great to see that this is happening here in France. I mean, how many people in the room, you know, I'm very curious um, to, to understand this. How many people in the room want to stay, just raise your hand if you want to stay in Paris after 42 versus going to a different place. <laughs> <laughs> and, or, or raise your hand if you want to stay in France. Okay. And raise your hand if you want to go specifically to San Francisco, Silicon Valley. Okay. And raise your hand if you want to go to New York. Okay, there's still a bunch of other, there's, so I still feel like we've only got two thirds of the people in the room, so I don't know. Is there one place that a lot of people want to go to that I didn't mention, or is it a lot of little places? Japan. Do a lot of people want to go to Japan, or just you? <laughs> huh, a lot of people want to go to Japan. That's interesting. It, makes, it all makes sense. I, I never, I've never thought about it as a particularly entrepreneurial place. But, um, but, um, but all, I think all those things are true, for sure. But yeah, we gotta I, not I also know that it's probably one of the most difficult country to go yeah. in if you're not actually uh, from Asia or actually from Japan. But yeah. Yeah. That's no, also but, the yeah. challenge, which but, is interesting. But again, if you have a personal passion for it, you do. I mean, you know, you asked the question, would I, somebody over here asked the question, would I, you know, would I, do, would I have been able to be successful in the way that I was if I was doing this in 2015 <coughs> instead of in 2001? Um, when everything was melted down. Um, and I'll answer that question a second time, actually, in this context. Um, 
So I think it would have been hard, harder than it would have been then. But if I were my age and was the person that I am today, um, rather than in 2001, I am almost certain I would move to Beijing, China. Because I think there is so much going on there. It's unbelievable what's going on there. Um, and it is, it's still a very hard place to crack if you're not from there. Um, and it's not even about so much whether you're Chinese or ethnically or not Chinese or speak Chinese or don't speak Chinese. It's still sort of a place where you have to be from there to really be in the center of things, which, you know, I think is true in a lot of parts of Europe, too, although it's changing somewhat. Um, but there's so much going on there and so much opportunity there. It's a very hard place to live. Like the air is difficult to breathe. And I mean, I've, I've lived there myself and I've spent a reasonable amount of time there. But it's so dynamic and so exciting um, that I think in some ways um, it's a pretty – frothy environment too, but I think there's so much opportunity in China. I probably would be living there if I were not necessarily you because everyone here is learning how to make things, which I was never able to do. Um, but if I'd been me at 24 in 2015, I might be moving to China right now. But Japan, I mean, there's lots of other interesting places. Are there other places that several people raise their hand for Japan? I mean, I always assume it's either stay in France or go to San Francisco or maybe go to New York. Um, Japan is interesting that several people said Japan. Does anybody here want to go to China? Is anybody from China? <laughs> no, okay. So any chance of getting a woman to ask a question or is it not going to happen? I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but okay, awesome. Hi, hey. uh, I'm no student from the school. Uh, but I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> ah, <laughs> I'm too old cheating. for that. No, I'm too old for that. Cheating. Um, anyway, I have an interesting question. Is that all of the all of them are students? They are all working on development, and um, so I have a question because I think you're concerned. Um, what would make the difference between all of them to be recruited by startups or to be entrepreneur then? So, so I'm not sure I totally understand the question. What would make the difference? What skills? Do you, you know, do um, startups, startup entrepreneur look for? So um, I think anyone who is capable of being an, a technical entrepreneur is capable of going to work for a startup. Um, I think it's more, and vice versa in, in a lot of ways, technically. I think it's more a question of personality and of whether you are the kind of person who really has a strong desire to create something specific um, versus being somebody who doesn't necessarily care about that and just wants to work on something that they think is really interesting. For better or worse, I was always somebody who just wanted to work on something I thought was really interesting and I felt like, well, my odds are gonna be better if I do that than if I try to make something myself as long as I pick well and early. Um, so that's what I did. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, both of those paths are possible for people for sure. The one thing that I wouldn't do um, is, and I in times like this, um, it happens a lot, especially in San Francisco, I see it happening a lot, is, and this is more something that happens with the kind of people who have an MBA degree, which I don't, does anybody in this room have an MBA? Anyone? Okay, so you don't have an MBA, right? So, so, okay, I don't either, so we can make fun of them, that's good. Um, <laughs> so so um, I think it's sort of more of an MBA type of impulse in some ways, but um, people will say, yeah, I want to start a company, you know? And they say, oh, oh, that's awesome, what do you want to do? So, oh, I don't know, I just, I know I want to start a company. I'm like, what are, what are you talking about? Like, what, it's, I mean, you know, you make something because you want to make something. Um, and in an environment like this, it's sort of become a job to be an entrepreneur, you know, and it's sort of become prestigious to be an entrepreneur and something that impresses people at a party or something. That's a really, really bad reason to start a company. Um, I mean, starting a company, I, I have never had children, so it's yet, not yet anyway, so it's presumptuous of me to say this, but from the friends I have who have started companies and have children, I hear over and over again consistently that like, yeah, like starting a company is like having triplets or something, you know, it's like it's really, really difficult. Um, and you kind of have to stick it out once you hire people and then if you have investors, it's a long-term commitment. So it's not something you just want to kind of 
stumble into because you think it might be cool to start a company. Like I think if you're going to start a, you shouldn't really start a company. You should create something that you want to create. And and a business is just a corporation or a business. It's just a vehicle for the delivery of the thing that you want to create. I think it turns out to be the best vehicle for the for the building and growth of a creative endeavor because it's the vehicle that allows you to attract people and money, both of which you need over time to grow. Um, but start from saying, okay, I want to make something and I believe this is the right vehicle to transmit it through. Um, don't start by saying, I'm, I, I want to be an entrepreneur. My goal is to be an entrepreneur. Like, I don't think anybody should have a goal of being an entrepreneur. I think people should make stuff that they want to make. All right. Um, oh, sorry. So if you wanted to do a, oh, sorry. We can do two. I'll try to be more brief. Yeah, if you wanted to do a, a startup today, do you think San Francisco is still an interesting place? Because I'm thinking of all these big company who can afford like good salary, but to do a startup, everything's very expensive. There is a lot of competition. Yep. And I what do you think yep. about this? I do think San Francisco is still a really good place. Um, it is really hard. It's really expensive. Um, we were talking about this at lunch, by the way, just as an FYI. A $100,000 or 100,000 euro salary in San Francisco is not a good salary, just so you understand this. Like, you pay taxes as high as you pay in France, you get no social benefits, you have to pay for all of your health and insurance costs yourself, housing is unbelievably expensive, you're like almost poor if you have a $100,000 salary in San Francisco. I'm not kidding. Um, you're kind, you can make ends meet, but it's not a comfortable, luxurious life. Um, so um, it is a very competitive time right now, at the same time, there's a lot, it's like China in a way, there's a, Beijing, there's a lot going on and, and being in a dynamic environment, you know, maybe there's a lot of fish, you know, bumping into each other, but there's a lot of fish and um, that's, that's never a bad thing. I think it's not the only place though. I think you can, you can start a company anywhere. There's incredible companies that have been built in practically every place in the world. Um, maybe not North Korea, but like pretty much every other place in the world. Um, so don't go to North Korea. Um, but, but really, almost anywhere. Um, and I think, you know, I would love to see Paris develop more as a startup center. Um, I think there's things that make it great. And there's challenges. I th I'm on the board of one company which is based primarily in Berlin, Germany. And that's a great place to build a startup because it's not an expensive place to live. There's a lot of great engineers there. There's a lot of creative talent there. Um, and we've built the company so far at one third of the cost of what it would have taken to build the same company in San Francisco. Um, so I don't think you have to, but I also wouldn't say it's bad, don't do it. I think it's still the heart of, it's the messy, complicated, difficult, expensive heart of startups, but it's, it's still a good place to go, for sure. Um, I will promise one more last one, and then I'll, I'll hand it back over to Xavier. Uh, thanks. Sure. Uh, I have a very short practical question about San Francisco again. Yeah. Uh, just. I guess it's very hard for us foreigners, uh, French people, to work in San Francisco yep. because of the visa and stuff. So yep. what do you think would be the best size and age of a company, I mean, the, the, the easiest target to work for? To go and work for? I, I, I don't know, honestly. I, I think um, the visa thing is awful in the U.S. and it's, it's, a, it's really a problem. Um, I don't know how it gets fixed, but I think, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's a prescriptive rule. If you find a company that you like there that you really want to work for and they have the ability to help you with a visa, then just do it. I don't know that the size of the company actually makes a difference. Do, do you think the, like between 10 or 1,000 people or 10,000 people? I, I, again, I think it's, it's situationally specific. You know, the way, that the, the way that the visa programs work in the U.S., it's not guaranteed, but I don't think it matters all that much whether you work for a 10-person company or a 1,000-person company. Just make sure the company or you have good immigration lawyers helping and cross your fingers and hope for the best. But it's, it's a really bad problem in the U.S., unfortunately. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Merci. Any thoughts? No? Je t'en prie.
<laughs> you know, he speaks better French than I speak English. So no, that's definitely not true. He can, he can, he can <laughs> do a conference <laughs> in French. <laughs> C'est pas vrai. Merci <laughs> 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 yeah, à vous. Je suis content que vous soyez venus. Je m'aperçois que vous parlez de mieux en mieux anglais. Alors, je vais peut-être les bons exemples <laughs> du jour. So, d'habitude, it's really harder in English usually. So, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> merci à vous. À bientôt. Et puis, merci à Matt d'être venu. Merci. Merci vraiment beaucoup. Merci.